Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our online service. This morning we begin with a time of praise and worship led by our musicians from their homes. Then we have some sharing and prayer from our church family members. And after we've opened the scriptures together, there will be some discussion questions. So do stay with us until the end. Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4 says, When I look at the night sky, consider the heavens and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, that you have established. I think, who are we, mere mortals, that you would be mindful of us, human beings, that you would consider us and care for us? But the wonderful thing is, God does care for us. He is mindful of us. In John chapter 1, it says that those who believe in Him and receive Him, He gave the right to be called sons and daughters of God. Not through a physical birth, but a spiritual, supernatural rebirth. Children of the Most High King. And so we can approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence to receive His mercy. Just 
during the week and just to let you know that although the office is closed we are still here for you we're working from home and we'd love to hear from you so if there's anything that you'd like to say to us or if you're in need of anything just let us know this morning I'd just like to share a passage of scripture with you it comes from Hebrews 12 2 and it goes like this let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross and is now seated at the right side of God's throne. So let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus through this COVID-19 and friends, I encourage you to contact each other, to still be there for each other. God bless you all from Alan and I and our family. Houses, cars. 
Good day. Won't you join me this morning in a, in a time of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just come to you at a time when the world is grappling with this coronavirus. And Lord, there's much uncertainty in the world at large. Uncertainty about jobs, uncertainty about schooling and the economy. But one thing's for sure, Lord, we know that you, we can trust. You are constant. You are there yesterday, today and forever. Lord, we thank you that through the internet we can share these prayers and share worship together and listen to sermons from our, our, our pastors. And thank you that the church is online and um, you have enabled us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We pray for our nation today. We pray for our leaders and for the difficult decisions that they have to make regarding uh, the economy and returning to schools and all of these sort of things. And we pray for wisdom for them. We pray, Lord, that you will give them guidance. Your Holy Spirit will come and show them the way, Lord. We thank you for our state president, uh, his belief in you, Lord, and his trust in you. And we pray that you will especially guide him in uh, all the decisions that have to be made regarding this coronavirus. We ask, Lord, for, at this time for protection for our families and friends. And we pray for patience for our nation. Many people seem to be taking the law into their own hands. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just convict them of the need to obey the law and just to be patient. We pray for our economy, Lord, and that you will supernaturally stimulate the economy once this virus is over. Finally, Lord, we pray for guidance and wisdom for our teachers and everybody involved in the education uh, business. Help them to make the correct choices, Lord, as the students eventually go back to school. And so we lift up all these needs to you, Lord Jesus, in your precious and wonderful name. Thank you and Amen. Every once in a while, we're reminded that we are not quite so in control of our lives as we might think we are. And recently, that seems to have been emphasized all the more as we try and deal with all the repercussions of this pandemic. And what I mean by that is sometimes we think we are where we are in life because we've made it happen through good decisions and we've worked hard and we have kind of paid our dues. And there is a measure of truth in that because your decisions of yesterday do affect your today. Then something like this comes along and messes all that up. But then I'm reminded again that from another point of view, if we're honest, so much of our lives has just been God's grace anyway. And yet not everything we have is because we've earned it. And it would be true to say that at times we just, as, as it were, stumbled into blessing because you know you really didn't earn all that comes your way. I know this is true for me and I'm sure for you and brings about a sense of gratitude. It's like part of our lives are governed by grace, unmerited favor that has come our way. And yet another part of who we are and what we become is about the truth of the decisions we've made and the work we've done and the lives we've lived. John, when he introduces Jesus in his gospel, he says, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus was all grace and all truth all the time. He wasn't the balance of, that's often how we think of it, he was all grace and all truth all the time. In other words, he never compromised grace to have truth, and he never compromised truth to have grace. But strangely enough, as believers, it is often the grace part that is more unsettling for us. For example, one day Jesus and his guys are traveling and they go into the city of Jericho. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the final time. Jericho is not that far from Jerusalem and the ruins of Tel Jericho can be visited today and is often referred to as the oldest city in the Bible. So Luke records for us, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through and Jesus encounters Zacchaeus the tax collector. Now Jericho was the city of priests in Jesus' day. That is where many of the Sadducees lived. And the Sadducees needed to stay clean for the temple. So what they couldn't do is touch a dead body, 
They could also not touch Roman money. And the reason was that money had pictures or images of pagan gods or rulers. So they could not touch money. So how are they going to collect the temple taxes? If I collect the money, I'm going to be unclean. And then I can't function as a priest. So they hired people who worked with the dead bodies for them, who collected and changed Roman money to Jewish money, which they could handle because it had no image on it. Also, from the time of Caesar Augustus, Roman money not only carried an image of the Caesar on it, it also now had the Latin word of deity, divus, as the inscription on it, referring to the Caesar. And this was one of the ways to advance the worship of divine Caesar. But if you were one of those who handled Roman money or worked with dead bodies, you could never enter the temple because you're going to be permanently unclean. You could also not go to the synagogue because you're unclean. And don't you touch me because if you touch me, you'll make me unclean. And what is more, we're going to call you a sinner. You're going to have a label. This was something to be avoided. So it was frowned upon to be hired by the Romans or the religious leaders to do this work they wouldn't do. We see this very clearly illustrated when the very next day Jesus is in the temple and the religious leaders try and come up with a question. And Luke records it for us this way. They hope to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So first let's spend a little bit of time on this question because to me it illustrates the brilliance of Jesus perhaps better than any other thing that happened during the period of his earthly ministry. And it also shows their hypocrisy in handling Roman money. So here is what happened. Now this interaction is taking place right up there by the temple, on the temple mount, where the sacrifices are made every single day. And they come to Jesus and they start by trying to butter him up. And so they say, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And so they have a question for Jesus. And here is their question. Is it right for us to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now let me tell you a little bit about this tax. It was a poll tax. And a poll tax was a tax on every single Judean. Regardless of their gender and regardless of whether they were working or not, everybody had to pay this tax. And everybody in Judea hated this tax because this tax coincided with the time when Judea came under direct Roman rule. So they hated this tax because it reminded them that they were not a free people. So this is a good question. If Jesus says yes, it gets him in trouble with the Jewish patriots and many in the crowd. And if Jesus says no, they shouldn't pay the tax, it gets him in trouble with Rome. And there's a Roman garrison stationed right there next to the Temple Mount in the Antonia. And remember, this is the week of Passover. So anti-Roman sentiment is high. So it looks like they've got Jesus in a corner. I'm sure the crowd is silent and the disciples are worried. Oh no, they've come up with a good question. How in the world is Jesus going to manage this question? Here's what happens next. The text says, He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius whose portrait and inscription are on it. Now Judean Jews were required to pay this poll tax with Roman coinage. And this is what the coin looked like. It was the equivalent of a daily wage. And on the front was the image of Tiberius Caesar. And the inscription around the edge basically said, Son of the Divine Augustus, which really interpreted means Son of a God. And then on the back of the coin, it proclaimed Tiberius, the high priest of the Roman religion. So everything about this coin was offensive to Jewish people. So Jesus says, show me this coin. But that wasn't the worst part of it. They show him the coin. That means the Pharisees had one on them. Somebody had one in their pocket. Now picture this. Jesus asks to see the coin. He doesn't have one. He is not holding one. They are holding the coin in the palm of their hand and he asks them to look at it. And he says this, whose image or portrait is this and what is the inscription on it? And at this point in the conversation, it is checkmate, game over, Jesus wins. But we don't see it at first. We don't feel it. But I guarantee you the crowd did. And here's why. Because the religious leaders and teachers of the law are carrying around images in their pockets and in their hands. This is one of the big ten, the second commandment. You are not allowed to make any image. Judean Jews had no images in their homes, no images in the temple, no images in the city. It was against God's law to have or to make any kind of image. This is a big thou shalt not. And here they are in the temple. And to rub it in, Jesus asks, 
who image is this and whose inscription is this? Just five years before this event, Pilate actually brought in shields into the city of Jerusalem that had a picture of Tiberius Caesar on them and an inscription on the shield. He didn't have them put in the temple. He just brought them into the city and people rioted. It caused such a disruption that even though Pilate loved to rub the Jews' nose in it, that they were not an independent state, even Pilate relented and removed the shield. Now, these religious leaders were in no position to criticize Jesus because they're carrying around on the Temple Mount this idolatrous imperial money. And Jesus asked them the question, whose portrait and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied, probably feeling very sheepish at this point. They know it's over. You're handling Roman money that has Caesar's image on it with the inscription divine Caesar and it is in your pocket at the temple. Jesus says to them, well then, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. In other words, don't you think you should give that back to Caesar then? And Luke ends with these words. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public and astonished by his answer, they were silent. Now let's go back to our story with Jesus entering Jericho. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. And the reason he was wealthy is because he was a chief tax collector. And as a chief tax collector, he had gone to Rome or had contacted the Roman representative, probably the governor, and he had purchased the right to collect taxes. And as a chief tax collector, he basically had a pyramid scheme that he would then hire other tax gatherers who would hire other tax gatherers. And they were called tax farmers. And they would set up at different stations on riverbanks and port cities and crossroads, all kinds of places. And they would collect a variety of different kinds of taxes and it would all funnel up to Zacchaeus. And he was very, very wealthy because as long as Rome got their money, they didn't care how much or what kind of surcharge or what kind of extra the tax gatherers charged the people. As long as Rome got what Rome wanted. So Zacchaeus was hated. Everybody in the community knew him and pretty much everybody hated him. But Luke records for us that Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, he didn't necessarily want to meet Jesus. The odds of that were very slim anyway. He didn't want to get too close. But like a lot of us, he was curious. Besides, Jesus was just passing through. So Luke goes on to tell us, So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. So Jesus, this great rabbi, comes to town. A crowd gathers to see him. So why is Zacchaeus in a tree? Why didn't he just stand in the front of the crowd? It says he ran ahead. Remember, he can't touch anybody. He works with Roman money. So he can't just go stand in the front. They would say, get away, don't touch me. You're unclean, you're a sinner. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. And here's what I think. This is not in the text. Luke doesn't say this. But when Jesus stopped, the whole group stopped. He turns and there is a man, a grown man in a tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I think there was a hush that fell over the crowd. And here's what they thought. Finally, 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 somebody's going to call this guy out. Finally, somebody has the courage to face this guy down. Finally, somebody's not intimidated. And finally, he's going to get what he deserves. And the crowd prob probably spread out and created a path. This grown man climbs down from the tree and they're thinking, this is it. And as he makes his way down and as he moves his way through the crowd, Jesus shocks everybody listening and everybody in the first and second century who would have read this story by saying, I must stay at your house today. What? I imagine at this point the disciples groan, oh, we were just getting the approval of the people. The text says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. It's like, what? This isn't how it works, right? We got you early. We're prepared. We are Jesus fans. And then this basically this traitor to the nation, an outcast from society who has ripped all of us off, gets to meet him. We didn't even get to meet him. And Zacchaeus gets to have a meal with him. So unsettling, so upside down, so backward, so unexpected. Everything about it is wrong. It was unsettling to Jesus' original audience and it doesn't seem fair. We don't always understand God's economy, the way that God sees the world, the way that God sees you and the way that God sees me. Let's see how this plays out as the story continues. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 
Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. How can he say that? Because clearly, just this one encounter with Jesus has changed his life. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. How do you say God's salvation in Hebrew? Yeshua. Yeshua in English, Jesus. There is a play on his name. Jesus said to him, today salvation, Yeshua, has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Now Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. In the same chapter after this, he enters Jerusalem and the Sadducees and the ruling council plot his death. Why? What is wrong with coming to seek and to save the lost? But it is where that phrase, I came to seek and to save the lost, comes from. Remember last week we looked at a remez, a Jewish way of teaching, where the rabbi assumes the listeners know the text they are referring to. So they would quote a verse and the student would have to know where it came from and what came before and what came afterwards. So where is Jesus quoting from when he says, I have come to seek and to save the lost? It's Ezekiel 34 that starts by saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Basically saying, you leaders of my people, you shepherds of my flock, you have scattered the flock and did not take care of them. Therefore, I myself will become the shepherd and I will seek and save the lost. What does Zacchaeus hear Jesus say? Zacchaeus may know that he is lost. But he is a lost sheep. He is not a goat. He is not excluded. He is still a sheep. Jesus has just called him the son of Abraham. I bet for the first time in his life he heard somebody say, You may be lost, Zacchaeus, but you are still one of God's people. He probably cried like a baby. I don't think anybody had said anything like that to him in years. What did the Sadducees hear Jesus say? You lowlifes. You make this man climb a tree not to touch you. He's one of God's sheep, and you've excluded him. Who do you think you are? You have treated him harshly and brutally. And what else did everybody hear Jesus say? What is Jesus saying about himself? I myself will become the shepherd, declares Almighty God. I will seek and save the lost. Who is Jesus claiming to be? God. This is one of the clearest, I am God. I came to seek and to save the lost. Then you have these religious sects today who say, where does Jesus say he is God? You know, where does he claim to be God? He says it and he claims it all the time. But you have to know the text. Throughout his ministry, Jesus invites you and Jesus invites me. Jesus invites all of us to see the world differently and to see people differently. To see the people around us differently and to see our relationship with God differently. Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is characterized by an unsettling generosity towards people. And Jesus, through his ministry, is asking me, and Jesus is asking you, can you handle that? Will you participate in that? Will you step into a system where the undeserving get exactly what they don't deserve? Would you be willing to extend to others exactly what they don't deserve? Because my Heavenly Father has extended to you exactly what you don't deserve. Will you participate? And of course, all the prodigal sons go, hallelujah, yes, right. And all the prodigal daughters are like, hallelujah, yes. And all the prodigal husbands who blew up their marriages and blew up their families and thought God is never going to listen to another prayer of mine, say absolutely yes. And all the prodigal wives and mothers who have ditched their responsibility and ran off and did something irresponsible and woke up three or four years later thinking, I'll never put my family back together. And I can't imagine that God would ever hear my prayers say absolutely yes. But what about people like me? And if you're like me, what about people like you? The early to the parade people. Those who see themselves as the good guys. What do we say? Can we extend a level of generosity to others that we may not feel they deserve? Jesus says to people like me and he says to people like you, he says to everybody, he says, look, when you begin to understand what my father's kingdom is like, when you begin to begin to understand the value system I've come to introduce into the world, When you step into this and fully embrace it every single day of your life, it may feel like 
that the last are actually first and the first are actually last. And it will feel unfair. But it's beyond fair. Because in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, over and over Jesus emphasized this. Everybody is invited. Everybody. Everybody is invited. The people with baggage, the people with regret, the people with a past. Along with, and this is the kicker, along with all the arrogant people who judge people with a past and the baggage and the regret. And the truth is, we've all fallen short of God's standards. Now the amazing thing is this. Grace doesn't compare. Grace doesn't compare because grace in Jesus is always married to truth. Everybody, everybody is invited to the kingdom of God. And everybody gets in through the same door. Jesus, through Jesus. Grace and truth personified. Jesus, who called sin, sin, called sinners, sinners, and then died for all the sinners. Jesus, who called sin a sin, and then laid down his life for the sin of the sinners. And everybody comes through the same door the same way by placing their personal faith in Christ as their Savior, trusting, this is it ready, trusting that what He did on our behalf made us right with God, regardless of how unright we've been and regardless of how unsettling that might sound. And I can understand how the crowd and how we could struggle with this. But this is also the part where I just think, surely there's something on the inside of you that thinks, What if that were true? Because the system that Jesus leaves us with at the end of his ministry, the system that the Apostle Paul and people and others would come along behind Jesus would tease out and explain and document for us is better than fair. And here's the takeaway. Would you be willing to show this broken world how accepting, how welcoming, how forgiving, how restoring and how loving our Heavenly Father is? Maybe for somebody who's watching, your experience of what you were taught about following Jesus was something else. It seemed all about rules and trying a little harder and made you feel less than and it caused you to walk away. Then this morning I urge you, wouldn't you at least consider reconnecting with your Heavenly Father and know what it feels like to be embraced as His child. And if for any reason you feel that you're not part of God's family, then in a few minutes I would like to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer doesn't make you a Christian. These words don't make you a Christian. The prayer is simply your expression of you putting into words your trust in Jesus. And by faith believing that you are received into the family of your Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe you are my Father. I believe Jesus was your Son, who you sent into this world to die for my sin. And right now I place all my trust in what He did on my behalf. I'm not trusting my behavior. I'm not trusting my promises. I'm not trusting my good intentions. I'm placing all my faith in what Jesus did when He died on the cross for my sin. Receive me into your family. Receive me into your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, I pray that all of us who see ourselves as part of your family, may we be that generation that is known not for what we believe, not for what we do on Sunday mornings, but for this unique, almost irresistible love that we have for others that comes from you. And we pray all these things in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Following are some questions you might like to consider. If you're watching with a family member, it's an opportunity to discuss what the gospel passage highlighted. Hope you'll join us next week for our Pentecost service. Bless you.